let's start at the beginning here and ask a question of where does the oxygen come from that we breathe? What do you think? Well, it comes from trees, right? Is that what you think? Okay. Well, we wind up with the oxygen coming from the ocean, not from trees. So if you answered trees, you failed your earth science exam. You have to go home, call your mother, and tell you have to repeat the, the semester because that's, that's not where we are here. We were taught as kids that photosynthesis coming in and out from trees is what generates our oxygen. But more than 50% of that oxygen comes from the ocean. Show of hands, how many people knew that? That's the ocean. Right, this is a learned group. You're already pre-selected to be interested in these subjects. <laughs> so we have a lot of work to do because most people don't realize that. So as we look at the misunderstandings of the ocean, the lack of knowledge of the ocean, let me point to the slide that's up here right now. You see that red ribbon that's up here? That is showing the heat transfer of equatorial warmth and bringing it up to the northern latitudes, the Arctic. As that happens, we're keeping Europe warmer than it normally would be based on how latitudinally elevated Europe is. Now that ocean circulation is complemented by the dark blue that is deep water and goes down, and we don't see that water again for about 1,000 years. This slow circulation has been with us for 6,000 years at least without interruption, but along comes we humans and we're interrupting it. We're winding up with the polar ice caps melting. As they melt, we don't know how fast they're going to melt. We know they are melting. I was just up in Greenland this summer watching it. And, and you see sea level rising. We can measure sea level as it's rising. And that's a problem. But what we don't know, any land investor near tidal water, you don't know when you're going to get that sea level rise, how bad. But you know it's going to come. So there's instability in our economy because of this. There's instability in our planet because of this as well. So the oceans provide us with a stable environment in which to grow. The oceans also provide us with protein in order for people to be fed. Millions of people eat fish and eat this protein. We also have pharmacy coming from the sea. We have cures for diseases that are coming from the sea. And that environment and that ecosystem is changing rapidly. It's migrating to the poles because we are warming. So what we're today, since we are in Boston, what we're today's New England lobsters are probably going to be tomorrow's Canadian lobsters. And there'll be a shoreside impact from that economically, socially, but also environmentally as these ecosystems change faster than we can keep track of them. So here's the image that you probably saw in your high school textbook. This is the image you should have seen in your high school textbook. Now, can we rewrite the books? We, perhaps, but we need to be educating people as to what the realities are. So I'll offer to you that there is an international effort ongoing right now, the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Maybe some folks have heard of that. Perhaps a show of hands, how many people are familiar with that? Modest, there are many UN decades. This one's really important, they all are perhaps, but this one is the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And you could see the number of goals, objectives, et cetera. I'm just gonna focus on a few of them so that we can really see where I think we need to be moving. But there are 276 projects. Most of them are unfunded. They are great ideas. They are scalable ideas. I would encourage you to take a look at this if you are so inclined. I'm going to focus on three. I'm going to focus on mapping the entire ocean. I'm going to focus on the ocean observing and, and measurements. The idea of taking the vital signs of the ocean, the pulse, the respiration, the blood pressure, the temperature of the ocean. The ocean's the patient. Our human activity has caused the patient to be ill. We need to ripen that ocean into a healthy entity that's going to sustain our lives, our welfare, and our economy. But if we look at what's missing here, we have no Gray's Anatomy. We have, thank you, we have the Gray's Anatomy of the human body, we have the human genome, but we don't have a good map of the world's ocean. Thank you. If you take a look at this image, that which is light blue, light blue gray, 75% of the ocean, it's unmapped. We don't have the gray's anatomy of the patient. We have facsimiles of it. We have representations of it. We don't have real maps. The UN Decade of Ocean Science is trying to cure this by having a project called Seabed 2030. The goal is to map the world's ocean by the year 2030. We might make it. We'd be close. But I think we can if we decide to make this a priority. But we need a map of the ocean. It's unconscionable that we don't have a good map of the world's ocean. Now let's talk about temperature. 
There are floats, the Argo floats, that are 3,800 today in number. They're supposed to be 4,000, but we don't have the full deployment. We need more investment. The United States government pays for 50% of this global network. And these 3,800 floats, ideally 4,000 floats, spend 10 days underwater and come up to the surface and then broadcast their position. Now, if we look more carefully and zero in at the United States level of density, look to the right, look to the left, Atlantic and Pacific, those are the number of floats that are up on just a two-day interval, because the rest of them are still underwater during their 10-day excursion. That's a rather lean number of temperature and climate-based assessments that we're making in order to give you the forecast that you need. But now let's look at how many we have on land. See all those blue dots? That's why you get such a reliable, and I hope you find them reliable, weather forecast for your safety of life and property in terms of what's happening on land. We have nowhere near this level in the ocean. We have the tools. That's an Argo float in the upper left. We have, no, uh, we have research ships from the agencies and federal governments and institutions, but we also have sail powered, we have wave powered, we have a number of different tools that can give us the opportunity to enhance this measurement. We even have fleets of underwater robots that can talk to each other, recharge underwater, bring laboratories on chips in order to analyze the biota, the biology component of the ocean, but we just don't have enough invested in this in order to do it well. We also have submarine telecommunications cables. They're bringing the, the transit of information and dollars back and forth between continents, islands, and communities. Every one of these cables can be outfitted with a module that collects oceanographic information in order to tell us more about the ocean. But we don't do that. There are two countries that are doing it right now actively. Portugal and France are making investments in what are called smart cables. But I note that our friends at Google have announced five cables being put in in the Pacific. I didn't hear anything about smart cables there, and I would assert that that's probably not smart. We ought to be putting in informed smart cables to do the humanitarian side, the safety side, the environmental side, as well as transmitting that information across the oceans. So here, warning to viewer discretion. You can't fix what we don't measure. And we are not measuring at a sufficient level to answer the societal questions we're wrestling with. How high is sea level going to rise when? We're not measuring enough to be able to tell you that. And if you're a real estate owner, I think that's something you need to be considering. How is the fisheries population going to relocate from one geography to the next, and when? What will happen to those coastal communities, and when? We need better observations, better measurements, and a better density of these measurements in order to get there. We can't fix what we don't measure well. So what I would propose in doing so, as we increase our ability to map and measure the ocean, that we'll be able to improve the forecasts and outlooks that are given. So here's a secret for you. The people who make climate, weather, and ocean models, they don't make the best model they can. They make the best model that can accept the amount of data coming in and that could fit on the size computer that we as a society choose to spend the money for them in order to do. So we can do better with more data, we can do better with bigger computers, and those models can improve. So we can reduce the uncertainty in the risk industry. Where does risk funnel? Risk funnels into reinsurers. Banks sell risk to the insurance company reinsurers. Insurers sell risk to the reinsurers. It doesn't get to the P&I clubs. It stays at the reinsurer level. If we could concentrate a discussion to co-develop, co-manage, and co-design, which would really just be another expense of due diligence to get the information necessary to quantify risk, we could really improve a lot of what we do to serve society. Now, if you're interested in carbon sequestration credits, warning, again, I should go back to the previous view, warning, this is like investing in environmental cryptocurrency. One could argue there's really nothing behind it. We don't have the fidelity of measurements to be able to tell you that, yes, you are, in fact, securing or reducing from circulation X number of tons of carbon. Until we get that measurement system in there, we're not there. So we need this co-design, co-funding, and collaboration with industry. We're not going to solve climate change by winning the hearts of people. I would like to think we could, but I don't think we get there with that alone. We're not going to solve it by legislation. I don't think we see the political process agreeing on much these days, so we're not going to get there. But we can affect change by proving that it's uneconomical to stay on the path we've been on, and that it's truly economical for us to take these new paths, which would be 
leading us to a more sustainable future. Lastly, I want to introduce you to my granddaughter. She was seven years old this past summer when I made this photograph. She loves the ocean. She's pretty okay with grandpa too, but she loves the ocean. And I don't want her to grow up in a world that looks more like a Mad Max movie set than the one that she's in right now, but that's where we're headed. And until we make the determination to start allocating resources, influencing governments, and making sure that we have these right decisions made, I fear for what her outlook is going to be. Now, she kind of has an idea of what I do and what I've done for the past 40 years of my career, but I don't want her to look back days, years from now and say, why didn't the old man try harder? That worries me, that hits me to the core. So I need you and all of you to be thinking about how we do this together and how we start building a better path to map, measure, and monitor the ocean, not just to solve our scientific curios, but to really be informative to society and show that there's a compelling direction for us to go in. So join me, please, in mapping, measuring, and monitoring, and let's not disappoint my granddaughter. Thank you very much. <laughs>